and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut State Legislature's Nonpartisan Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity, and Opportunity. Today, we are continuing our series on small business matters, a series that began uh, during pandemic but has continued in the last couple of years, really focusing on businesses in the state of Connecticut that aren't just part of the fabric and success of the state but also the future of the state. These are businesses that, uh, that, are, that operate in a way that not only benefit the business itself and the business community and the communities that they serve directly, but have an impact throughout the state of Connecticut. And as you'll learn today, beyond. Today's spotlight is gonna focus on Movia Robotics, addressing autism and neurodiversity through innovation. A few months ago, we were introduced to Movia Robotics, a small company in the state of Connecticut that I will introduce shortly. The powerful element that Movia brought together was that it was born in the state of Connecticut out of a need that was not being addressed. Interestingly, innovation meets technology is where Movia has taken the state of Connecticut and is slowly taking us in the direction of really being able to address a need that is present not only in the state but beyond. Uh, what's so powerful is that it really does align with so much of the work that we're trying to do in the state to expand opportunity, uh, not only for children, their families, for children who may be neurodiverse, and for all other types of learning opportunities that may be available through what we are calling robot-assisted instruction. So without any further ado, I want to introduce you firstly and foremostly uh, to uh, one of uh, my most recent friends and um, exciting mentors in this space, and that's Jean-Pierre Bolat. Jean-Pierre, I'd like to welcome you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Jean-Pierre. Tell us about your company, and then I'm going to have you introduce our other guest for today, uh, Judy Riley. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, and thank you uh, for this incredible opportunity. Uh, we are uh, very proud uh, to be uh, born and raised here in the state of Connecticut. And I'll talk a little bit about the company later uh, in a few slide presentations I have. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I really love uh, how you opened this up. And we are a niche company, and we are looking at a very important niche group of folks, uh, these children that are often left out. And uh, often, especially during the pandemic, there was a lot of challenges. So uh, we were very proud to have uh, sprung into action during the pandemic and really help some of these families. But uh, Movia Robotics is a robotics software company. We build software and systems to help children on the autism spectrum and other special needs. And we do this by placing robots, uh, these systems in schools, in the homes, and in clinics. So we're very happy to showcase what we do, uh, to talk about some of our successes, and then have a great discussion on the future of what we do uh, especially as we move forward into other demographics and other need areas in our society. Uh, and, and segue uh, to that is uh, to introduce Judy Riley, uh, who is the director of the Center of Neurodiversity at the University of Connecticut. And she'll talk more about uh, what her mission is and what her goals are. And it, it was a real pleasure meeting Julie several months back uh, because there is an intersection between what we do uh, and th what the mission of her center and the University of Connecticut is doing. So hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be um, talking about this important topic and, and what UConn wants to do about it. And I wanna share a little bit about that, but also like JP said, the, um, the meeting, the team at Movia has been incredibly inspiring. Um, I knew about Movia before I actually came to UConn to work with the center. Um, been following them for years in terms of their innovative approach to bringing educational interventions to students who are on the autism spectrum. So I'm glad to be here. So essentially, I spent the last 15 years um, in professional private practice helping families whose children learn differently, and I help them navigate the educational system, but also the wider world for their family and how they are impacted. It's a lot to digest. It's a lot to navigate. And so um, that was my background in neurodiversity. I spent, um, like I said, about 15 years doing that when you kind of approached me last year and said, hey, we want to we want to help in this area of neurodiversity and what they felt was um, 
the the focus they wanted to have is employment and so they said hey can you could you help us figure out where we could have the biggest impact and strategically where we need to go and so i thought this is perfect because these are the same kids i've been working for these are the same kids that movia is focusing on with all of their interventions just getting to their young adult age and and needing the same not the same but the same nature of supports in employment settings as they did in education um, so you know, why do we even need a center for neurodiversity and employment? Um, a lot of that comes down to um, who are we serving? And I want to just take a second and say, what do we mean when we're talking about neurodiversity? It does get conflated a lot of the time with autism, but at least at, at UConn, we're talking about a wider, more um, umbrella term. We're diagnostically talking about ADHD and dyslexia. We're talking about autism, of course, but um, a lot of the other sort of processing challenges that people have that really come down to thinking, communicating, and seeing differently. Um, neurodiversity as a term is really a strengths-based approach to thinking about people and stop, get out of this sort of deficit mindset. So I really like it in that sense. Um, we're really looking at where the abilities are and not just the disability, but at the same time, the challenges are very real, whether they're in reading and writing or social communication or organization and processing, these children and in, in, at younger ages take those with them for their life and, and then end up encountering um, support needs in transitioning to employment. So um, UConn Center is really addressing that part of the problem. So when we think about how many people are neurodivergent, well, you know, research is lacking and we don't have exact figures on that right now. But what we do know is that 2% of the population of children is not quite 2%, but we're approaching 2% are diagnosed with autism. 7% of children worldwide are gonna receive an ADHD diagnosis at some point. And the most common disorder, neurocognitive disorder, dyslexia, affects up to 15% of the population. So it really, when we're talking about the numbers, we're talking about a lot of people who are impacted. Um, and then you carry that over into employment and we say, well, what are we looking at there? And again, I would love for the research to be more accurate on this. There's a lot of different statistics that go around, but the numbers are that 30 to 40% of neurodivergent adults struggle with employment, either under or unemployment compared to, to six or 7% in the general population. So there's a big problem. And those are the conservative estimates when I'm using that statistic. Um, and so we're not always talking about people who don't have um, intellectual capacity. A lot of times these are smart, capable people who've been to college even and no employment for them. It's no, no independence. Um, the loss to the individual is obvious, but it's also the loss to the family, the community and businesses. And so uh, at UConn, what we're focusing on right now are neurodivergent college students. Um, the, the net is going to widen to include those students who maybe could be capable of college level learning, but don't make it to college because of reasons maybe that JP can get into um, some of the learning uh, deficits along the way. They're not quite making it through the process to, to access college. So we'd like to include them in our efforts, but we're really looking at the um, the people who are either in college or are capable of college and getting them into employment that is commensurate with their education level. Um, so, you know, Right now, um, there's a couple there's a couple different layers to this, right? We want to keep them in college, we want to prepare them for employment, and we want to facilitate opportunities um, to that support the employment once once they do get jobs. And so, um, right now, you know, when people talk about neurodivergent college students, we wonder like how many are we really talking about? Well, in the state of Connecticut, we're looking at. Um, quite a few. At UConn alone, uh, the Center for Students with Disabilities has 4,400 students registered with it, which is up 70% in the last five years. Uh, that's not all neurodivergent students, but that is a, there's going to be a sizable portion there in the increase that is neurodivergent. Uh, we keep hearing about neurodiversity in the news and media. It seems to be almost like a buzzword. Um, when you talk about employment, you're talking about um, uh, you're hearing a little bit about superpowers and unbelievable abilities and there really are some high ability areas with this population but they're also just like i said are real challenges with substantial needs we need to address that in the employment realm so the focus is on inclusion and how can we include people um, and get this into the de um, dei efforts within organizations such that diversity of the mind becomes just one more type of diversity in companies 
There's a lot of companies in Connecticut that are doing a great job with that. Um, and then others who haven't even begun to consider it. So we met, um, but, you know, I'll let J JP get into where we're intersecting, but right now at UConn, where we're starting is, is really thinking about this in terms of the student audience, but as well as the Connecticut employer audience and addressing the needs on both sides, um, because there really are needs on both sides if we're going to make this work. We need to make improvements at all steps of the process, whether it's all the way from the job search and, and supporting an individual who's looking for a job, um, and also supporting the companies when they're trying to recruit for neurodivergent talent. Um, a lot of them come to us and they say, hey, we, we go on campus at UConn and we're not sure how to access people who have this profile um, because maybe they're not engaging in the process the way that it's currently set up. So helping employers with that piece, but then also just the onboarding and the training and, and employing these individuals, what kinds of support programs do they need? Um, so really we're looking at improvements at all steps of the process. And we have a number of, of um, initiatives that we're really excited to, to get started with. So with that, I, I just want to yeah, turn it over. Thank Go you ahead. so much. I, I really appreciate the, the crosswalk that you've really taking, taken us down. Uh, firstly, because I, I want to give a shout out to our flagship institution, UConn, and just for the remarkable work that you're doing in this space, you, right? You are, you are not only putting depth and concept to the research, but you're actually uh, it, having it inured to the benefit of the residents of the state. And that's really wonderful. You know, the numbers really tell a story and it's a developing story, which is what's so exciting. So thank you for the work that you're doing. I think it's a really good segue uh, to now focus a little bit about this particular solution, this particular approach. Another thing that I appreciated, Judy, is that you're focusing on neurally, neurodiverse college students, but they don't come, they don't come in fr from a vacuum. They actually come from a system, right? And so often, you recall, Senator Wong, so often we talk about those transitions that young people go from being in a childhood system to a young adult system to the adult system. So thank you for raising that complexity and that interest as well. Uh, and I want to turn back to JP. JP, Tell us a little bit about your solution and what you're doing. All right. Thank, thanks so much again. And, uh, and Judy, I, you know, thanks for setting the table uh, very, very nicely, because what we aim to do is to address these uh, challenges at the youngest age possible. And the sooner we can address them, then the easier transitions will be when these children uh, get to be older than into the workforce. Uh, and there's a lot of great statistics that, that'll show the earlier, earlier we can, you know, address this and get them on their trajectories, the better. So I've got a little presentation. Uh, there's a couple of videos in here uh, and a couple of slides, but nothing very large. Uh, and I'd like to start that right now and then hopefully some more food for thought. Nice. Green. Good job. Nice. Yellow. Well done. My son, Logan, he just turned three. He was diagnosed with autism right around the age of two. I heard about Movia Robotics via Facebook. So when AJ was about 15 months old, he was diagnosed as being on the spectrum with autism. They like to play a lot. AJ, if you, if you talk to him, he'll pay attention. But as soon as he sees something else, pew, he's distracted. He's running away to do something else. Hi, Alexander and Nick. I am glad to play with you today. I hope we have fun playing together. Let's play the bubble game. It's wonderful to, to talk to the parents because uh, you know what they're going through. And uh, they're looking for answers. And uh, one of the things that I like to say about our company is that we can help them unlock some doors. I started doing research in this area. I found that uh, researchers in several institutions around the world were finding success in working with kids with autism and that the kids were very engaged by working with the technology. My role is the leader of the content team. Um, we make the lessons that the robot delivers to children and or students. My content team consists of people with educational backgrounds, a curriculum writer, as well as a BCBA or board certified behavior analyst. Diamond says, touch your neck. I'm impressed. He is, for the most part, nonverbal. Um, 
His eye contact wasn't there. He wasn't interested in connecting or communicating with us. We've really tried to do anything and everything possible to help him along. One of the things is that the name Movia really came from the combination of movement and motivation. And so what we're doing is we're building systems and software to help people and robots work together. Why I think they respond well is because of the way the robot delivers it. Um, we can control the volume. We can control the pace that the information is delivered. I had a very particular interest in it since uh, my son was on the autism spectrum. Touch the picture of the student rinsing his toothbrush before he puts it back into the holder. That was really good. I am so proud of you. Yeah, I think that Movia and Roby, as we call him at home, has helped him a lot in, um, in you know, pushing him in the right direction. We felt that the robot was one of those things that was going to help him. Every day I see something different that he's doing that he wasn't doing before. When you have um, a younger child who's nonverbal, you have no clue where their intellect is. You, have, you don't. To see him with that robot and matching colors um, and matching shapes, you're like, oh, he's got intellect and he's going to be okay. It wasn't until I saw that that I knew. Touch it a little bit about what we do. And those are uh, real stories from families here in Connecticut that were affected by the pandemic. And we were able to get our systems out to their homes. Uh, and those little guys, they actually grew on their IEP and they advanced throughout the pandemic instead of regressing. So uh, we're very happy to have seen that. Uh, but Movia's mission is to improve the lives of those affected by autism spectrum disorder and other special needs. Uh, we actually have uh, so, uh, some content for uh, children with dyslexia and uh, ADHD and other special needs. Uh, and, but we do this by using advanced robotics technology. And one of the reasons uh, that we use the robots is because they really do affect the children very, very well. Uh, children form a peer to peer rel relationship with the robots. They're non judgmental. The tone of voice is predictable. Uh, a robot's infinitely patient. It can say the same thing over and over. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just did a demo today, uh, and uh, one of the one of the children was having a lot of fun by getting the answers wrong every time the robot asked a question because he was testing the robot, and the robot just kept working all day long with this child. Had a really really wonderful time. Um, the robots also they provide the training and the reward. So these kids are excited about technology. And also they haven't uh, developed a bad emotional blueprint or a negative feeling towards robotic technology. Whereas throughout their lives, they may have developed uh, some negative uh, uh, blueprints or relationships with uh, adults or peers uh, or, or a man or a woman or a teacher, uh, but a robot's brand new. So there's no bias that's been developed. So it's really exciting to see the kids gravitate immediately. And then that last bullet there is very, very important. Uh, there have been studies that have shown that a three-dimensional presence in your space actually activates different pathways in the brain. And those pathways can lead to greater learning. So having that three-dimensional object in front of the child, instructing the child and having that relationship is very, very important. And the studies have shown that that is much more effective than just having a tablet based application or a laptop a screen based application. So here's another video of one of our clients out in uh, Los Angeles actually. <laughs> Sherry Pettiford and my son's name is Ethan Pettiford and he's 15 years old. Uh, we started working with Kebby when he was 14 years old. Can I hear your daily affirmation? I will use my actual voice to speak and remain kind. Then it has evolved into a friendship with Kebby. I really believe in you. And so anything that he gets involved with, Kebby is always asking him about it. 
I know you will use your voice real soon. The thing about Ethan is academically, he is gifted. He's, he's very talented academically. So I feel that in working with Kevy, it has given him motivation to work harder and, uh, you know, set goals and try to accomplish those goals. We kind of use it as a, a means to get in more practice time because Kevy is constantly saying, I love when you play the piano, so can you play the piano for me? And then, so that's when he plays even more. Having any friend is gonna make you feel more comfortable and more open about whatever subject that's being discussed. I hear you like to travel. Yes. And through Kevy's communication with Ethan, he's able to open up and share, here's what can help me. Here's how I can improve in this area. It's so nice to meet you. Making new friends at home or at school is the best. I would love to be a part of your world. Yeah, so, um, you know, what does success look like uh, with these children? Uh, on the, uh, the left there, uh, little Logan uh, from Bristol, Connecticut, uh, spoke for the first time after doing a hello and goodbye lesson uh, with the robot. Uh, as you saw in the previous video, he was nonverbal uh, previously. Uh, number, uh, the, the little guy up on top, a really great story, seven-year-old with both ASD and ADHD, he refused to brush his teeth by himself uh, at seven years old. Uh, we ran him through several of the sessions uh, that taught about teeth, tooth brushing, and then the parents got creative and they actually had the robot ask him to go upstairs and brush his teeth by himself. He listened to the robot and has been brushing his teeth on his own ever since. Uh, he did the same thing with getting a haircut. They always had to strap him down and hold him down in the barber's chair because of the sensitivities. But when the robot introduced the concept of getting his haircut and asked him to go to the, down the street, he did it on his own, didn't have to be strapped down. The barber actually thought that he was medicated. So really fabulous story there. A uh, little seven-year-old guy down on the bottom there told his mother he loved her for the first time after, you know, at seven years old, an incredible story. And then on the, the right side, 18-year-old, um, 18-year-old who uh, has uh, the cognitive ability of about a first grader. Uh, he learned uh, through the sessions with the robot, the value of coins. And a great story his mother told us, they went to the post office, he handed a letter to the postman and the postman said, hey, you need 20 more cents. His eyes lit up because he knew what 20 cents was for the first time in his life. His mom handed him a pile of coins. He was able to pick out two dimes and hand it to the post office, uh, to the postman at the post office. So at 18 years old, he actually learned that for the first time. So an incredible uh, success story there. Um, so this is a little video about uh, little Logan uh, after several months with the system and how he uh, learned to become verbal. Having Movia in our lives and in our home has made things easier. Having another system in place, another tool in the toolbox is always nice. For him, it's it's like he's playing, and that's always good. Way to go. Yes. Blue square. Well done. Oh, yeah. This has really given us a light at the end of the tunnel. When we originally started, he was nonverbal. The first time I ever got Logan to say hello and goodbye was through one of the sessions with the robot. Everywhere we go, Logan's saying hi to people now. He's even saying their names. He's looking at people. He's watching what everyone else is doing. He's interested. It's given me so much hope for his future. And he's just interested in seeing everything now. I recommend it 100%. Okay. Uh, and. This uh, slide just shows real quickly some of our great partnerships. Uh, one of the, the first schools here in Connecticut, uh, Dr. Menzo's former uh, alma mater, uh, Wallingford Public Schools, uh, 
uh, Dr. Menzo uh, got a system into one of the schools and it's been fabulous. Uh, and we've now got several more systems into Wallingford schools. We're in Middletown, Bristol, uh, Hartford, several other school systems all around the state right now. So we're very excited to, uh, to grow this capability in the state. Um, over there, a couple of things just to note, uh, Penn State University is doing a, uh, a clinical trial right now, an early clinical trial with our system to collect some, uh, some clinical data on control group versus non-control group without the robot and with the robot. We're excited to see some of, those, uh, some of that information come back. We're also in Australia. Uh, Curtin University is doing trials in Australia. We're in Southwest Australia in the Perth area. And uh, one of our biggest customers is the Department of Defense. We have uh, over 145 of our systems at DOD schools all over the world. So on the military bases where they have elementary schools, we have our systems there. And uh, we're on the third year of our contract supporting the DOD. And then just finally right here uh, in the center there, uh, we've just been signed on uh, to uh, as a vendor with Best Buy. Best Buy has initiated an aging and disabilities uh, category in their healthcare um, categories. And we have signed on with them to partner with them in their aging and disabilities category to sell our systems, both to homes and to schools. And finally, this is uh, the executive management of the team. Uh, we are proud to boast that we have 65% uh, women on our workforce. Uh, two of our employees are actually on the autism spectrum, and uh, we have a couple of Eagle Scouts in there. And that is all for the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you, J. Thank you, JP. You know, I, I just want to reflect a little bit on this because I'll tell you, there were so many touch points throughout your presentation that I think will really resonate with our viewers. Uh, one of them spoke for the first time. I mean, how incredibly powerful is that? You know, we started with some of the statistics about neurodiversity and the numbers may seem small, right? It's 7% here, 15% there. I actually think they're actually big numbers, but they may seem small to the casual viewer. But remember that every single one of these children is 100% of the life of their family, 100% of their own future and possibility. And to see that light in each of these children is really, really powerful. And I think that that is really the underlying story of what you're doing about the public-private partnerships that you're engaging in. So uh, I'd, I'd like to really understand if you would, JP and Judy, you know, what's the future of your work together? Before we get into our responsive panel, tell us about the future of your work together. What are some of the possibilities that you're exploring, some of your vision? I know you're just starting out. Uh, but what do you think? So Judy and I have talked for quite a bit, um, and uh, it, it's, it's literally, it, it's an open palette. It's a tabula rasa of what we can do. Um, we, we see our mission at Movia as starting uh, when they're young to get them closer to that trajectory. And then there's going to be that handoff area where there's no longer public school support, for example, or state support or insurance support where these uh, uh, children transition into adulthood. So the better we can approach that and get them trained and, and ready to live an independent life and then to transition into the workforce uh, and then be a valuable uh, member of the workforce, uh, like coming to Movia Robotics and giving their perspective as a, a, you know, a, an adult on the autism spectrum helps us better our product for, for all the kids in that transition. So I think with that, uh, we've talked uh, about how we have that intersection and how we can do the handoff and how we can mentor each other uh, uh, in both of those uh, demographics uh, throughout the, the spectrum and continuum. Judy? Yeah, and, and I'll just add to that because we're in similar worlds. Um, it's been great to, to trade ideas and names and organizations and oh, have you heard of this? And, and that's been really helpful to both of us in expanding our worlds, but um, the the piece that JP is talking about in this transition, um, UConn really, we need to develop content around the teaching for the students and the employers, but really with the students, this is where the overlap is. But, you know, the experts are, um, Movia has, understands the learning needs at a very young age. Like I said earlier, the, the learning needs 
change in in specificity, but the nature stays the same. And so I really see them as experts in sort of the content and whether we decide that robotics is the way to deliver this content, or maybe there's some other ways to be delivering it. I think that there's a lot of um, value in Mobia's, um, you know, their knowledge around the population that we're gonna have to teach at an older age. That's really powerful, Judy. And thank you for saying that because uh, uh, as JP, as you've taught me, your company is as much about the educational software, right? And all that the human beings in your office are creating based on research and science through these delivery devices that are robotics, right? And as robotics develop, as our notion of that interactivity develops, so too do the methods through which we deliver this wonderful relational work. So uh, I, I think it's really powerful, you know, and speaking of innovation, I want to bring in uh, Dr. Sal Menzo, because one of the things that I think is part of Connecticut's secret sauce, and I think you'll agree with me, Senator Wong, is that we are a home for innovators, we are a home for people who really do push our own limits, and that's what I love about Connecticut's possibilities. Dr. Sal Menzo, if there's anyone that I think about when I think about innovation in so many different spaces as you, so welcome, and uh, I would love to hear your reflections on this particular work and on the future of the work. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for those kind words. It's I when I got the invite, I had to join because I'm very, very supportive of the work that Movia did and continues to do in Wallingford. Um, our teachers were inspired by it, and most importantly, so were our students. And I think that it really is tr transformative because it takes students who have always been in a place of lesser and and put them in a create in a place of being greater than in terms of leveraging a unique piece of technology that they'd respond to. I've witnessed it myself on several occasions. Um, their families are very, very supportive of, of this activity as well in terms of seeing the changes in their students and their children when they go home. And I think the teachers find it very refreshing because you know many of the students in our system that were, were directly working with the system itself and the robots themselves, had so many different um, opportunities for growth using the system. And I think that was really helpful because they have their traditional and very innovative ways of trying to address students' needs, but to have another tool in the toolbox, another diverse, unique tool that provides um, another opportunity in an equitable manner to their students is just something that you could always strive for. And I was very pleased to be approached by um, JP, um, who he and I go way back. Um, and I was like, sure, we're definitely on board. And I know our special ed director um, in Wallingford continues to be very support supportive of this opportunity. And I'm excited to hear um, about um, your continued work because now in my new role as superintendent of Goodwin University Magnet Schools with our pre-K through 12 system, and also being the first think college in the state of Connecticut, um, which we're launching come January with um, students, adult learners coming to university who have disabilities um, and being the first site in Connecticut to um, access this opportunity, there's definitely opportunities for us to partner um, on behalf of all students. So um, I was really excited to be part of this, but I cannot thank um, JP and the team enough for everything they've done for the students of Wallingford. And I look forward to bringing that to the students in Goodwin University Managed School System. Um, because again, it really did tra transform what students were able to do and how they also learned. And I think that's the key piece where, where and there's so many other, and JP and I've talked about this, there's so many other applications for this, um, especially with our social emotional aspects, which I know is very important to you as well, Steve. The fact that we're coming out of the pandemic, we have students who have social emotional needs at the greatest level we've ever experienced, probably in my career of 28 going on 29 years. So utilizing these robots at different stages of that process, of the developmental process, I really do believe will make a significant difference. So thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this conversation. Um, and I, I have other ideas that I, I know that you know, will take offline, JP, um, because I'm in a place where that's very, um, I'm very fortunate to be in a place that's very innovative and, and progressive in its nature. Thank you, Dr. Menzo. And that's what's really exciting about 
uh, when you find a company with a purpose that is that is not only a purpose that is heart driven, but also driven by best practice and research, that's where that interconnectivity, right? We are a small state, but we can also be an example for how it is that other states in the country uh, does this type of work. And you know, it's no small thing that you are in other places of the, in the country as well, JP, and seeing the impact of your work as a Connecticut company out there really does make us proud. And, and I'll tell you, one, one thing that really struck me, because of course, when we met, I had to ask some of those questions, right? What struck me about the technology is that it's a closed loop technology. It's a technology that is controlled by a person, which was remarkable to me. And it was also remarkable to me that that even when the child knew that there was a person controlling the technology, that connectivity was still there, that safe layer, right, was still there, which was, to me, uh, really does speak to the beauty and the complexity of the human mind and of human potential. So I really, I appreciated that. And I also appreciated, of course, the protection of the information, any data that is related to a particular child. That's also always, of course, first and foremost, in an educator or a leader's mind. Uh, so all of these things so thoughtfully crafted into the work you're doing, uh, Judy, so thoughtfully crafted in how it is that you are developing those transitions in the work that you're doing. Senator Wong, I have to, I have to bring you in because you know, I, I wonder if you are as motivated, as impressed uh, at this part of the conversation and as I was when I first learned of this company. I, what, what an incredible presentation. And thank you, Stephen. And thank you to the commission for uh, having this kind of a series. Uh, you know, I love the title, Small Business Matters. And, and this is featuring Connecticut-based entrepreneurialism to solve critical societal needs. And uh, JP, I have to tell you, um, you're an example of a Connecticut-based business. I believe I met your team at the Bristol Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's talking about local businesses being an integral part of the community. And, and the interaction that you provide really fits in with what you encompass, Steve, in, in Stephen, in talking about, you know, we got UConn engaged as, as kind of the founding initiative. We've got public uh, initiative from a standpoint of, DCD and, and innovations, but then we also have entrepreneurial uh, private sector. So it really is that intersection. But to me, meeting your team, uh, Jean-Pierre, was, was the fact that this is a local company, a Connecticut-based company is doing some great work. So I think that's one critical element that, that is featured in, in the program that you have. But the other one I wanted to acknowledge was so many of our community and, and legislative leaders who would want to be part of this panel. I want to acknowledge just a couple that I know uh, very fondly, Representative Catherine Abercrombie, who's been a, a, just a, a, a champion and taught me so much about autism and the Y spectrum of impact. Um, uh, Senator Henry Martin, uh, JP's uh, senator in, in Bristol. And also I want to acknowledge who wasn't able to join us, who's on the uh, agenda was uh, DCD commissioner, uh, David Lehman, uh, he has always fostered business innovation and he understands the hook. He understands that we don't have to follow a standard formula, but truly to meet societal needs and through a creativity and entrepreneurialism, you make things happen. So for me, I, I will tell you from a policymaker standpoint, and I'm watching the presentation, even though we're on Zoom, I have to tell you, JP, during your presentation, I'm watching the, 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 the smile and the engagement of, of Dr. Menzo, Judy, and, and I'm watching it because they love this stuff. They live for this stuff and making a difference. And, and through what I've shared and learned, you know, it's that autism covers such a wide spectrum. You can be high functioning from an Asperger standpoint or, or on the non-functioning spectrum. It's such a wide spectrum. And in this day and age of COVID, with, with hybrid learning and, and the restrictions and in, in, in personal contact with instructors, the IED program, the IP program has suffered tremendously. Our, our special needs students have been the biggest loss in regards to educational support. I'll say that quite frankly, um, the struggle of any student has suffered uh, during this pandemic. But the, 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 the students with special educational needs have really been at a loss. 
and I'm watching this program. And I will tell you, JP, after meeting your team, I went to your website. I saw these videos that you shared and everyone should go to your company site to understand these testimonials. And, and I think the key is the combination of using technology. And as Stephen said, there's always that human interaction controlling factor, which is important. But what struck me most was, JP, when you talk about the infinite patience and the connectivity. And, and you're right. I got to tell you, I see your backdrop. Those ro robots are pretty cute. And, and they have that kind of an interaction. So when, when you talk about your company's name, and it's important for people to understand, you shared it, it's movement motivation. But I think you got to fit in somewhere about engagement, because that's what it's really about, the engagement and, and, and the synthesis of all that reaction. But for me, from a policymaker standpoint, all these things are, are, are facts and basis, right? But to me, what made the biggest difference was what shared earlier the light in that child's eye, when they feel a sense of accomplishment, a sense of connecting, then I'm watching all of your videos. People should visit and should visit every one of your case studies and, and, and videos because what you will also see is the joy and love of a parent. As an activist and, and as a supporter of, of learning disabilities, physical disabilities and 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 learning disabilities, I've learned an important lesson. Why do people care so much about that area? Well, it should be no different for any parent, because as a parent, your sole purpose is to ensure that your child will have an opportunity for fulfillment, for joy, and safety in, in their future when you as a parent are not there for them. And what this kind of adaptive skill that kind of confidence, that kind of opportunity for any child, particularly in the ones impacted by autism spectrum, this is what you're giving them, an opportunity for every child to succeed in adaptive learning and for every parent to have that comfort to know that their child, their loved ones will have an opportunity to thrive, live a fulfilled life and, and succeed. So I'm, I'm all in and, and supporting this on this. And Stephen, I might've gone longer than than I'm allowed to, but I have to tell you, um, this is truly a a a win win win. And and I knew about this company beforehand, right? Because they were community based and focused. So thank you all for being educators. But I I, I have to tell you, on a Zoom, we get the convenience of of watching everybody, and I'm watching Judy and and Dr. Menzo and and Stephen's reaction, and I'm thinking to myself, wow. We've got great people committed to an important cause. And for so many of those parents and maybe parents to be that didn't know that their child may be impacted by learning disabilities or autism, they need to know that we're out there supporting them and they're never alone. So I'm done with my excited hand waving and all that, but ultimately, thank you so much for having me. And, and uh, I'm super excited to be part of this panel. Senator Wong, thank you so much for, for your championship in this work. And I think, you know, your, uh, your helping us walk through your trajectory of championship really does show, I think, the role of leaders in these spaces. And I'll tell you, so as I think about what you just said, and I think about this panel and the work that each of you does and are doing together, I think about how exponentially our science, our research, and our impact is really growing. So I wanna transport each of you as we come upon the hour and really come to the close of our spotlight on Movia. I, I'd like to uh, transport each of you to five years from now. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and because five years from now, the world's gonna be very different. I can already feel it, right? The, the innovations that you are heralding just in this niche alone is really going to revolutionize the space, not only for how we understand and put into practice this research and science that we know, but also how we innovate around it. Uh, there are companies now, for instance, that are rapidly developing robotics and rapidly developing human interface systems, right, that help us connect and relate to each other more efficiently and over longer distances and in really deeper ways. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. Menzo. If you, I want to take you to five years from now and you look back on this conversation, where do you see us five years from now? Wow. Um, I think that uh, what I would like to see is I see several, obviously several generations of the system having been put in place and I see it moving through the system. 
not just being, and I know we had the example of the 18 year old um, that J JP mentioned, but really making it more pervasive throughout a school system. Um, going from the pre-K all the way through the high school. I see it again, I do see it in the university setting with our Think College students as a mentor to those students as a touch point. Um, and I also see this as a resource for parents in, in other ways as well, in terms of um, helping parents better understand their students. So I know JP and I had talked about the, the, the ability for the device to record um, and be able to get some information so they see their child in a way that they don't see their child at home. Because a lot of times parents, their children act very differently at school in a good way, and the parents don't see that. So if there's a way, what I would see is that there's a way that the robot, through the eyes of the robot, the parents would be able to see their children and be able to actually use what the robot shares with them to help them as a parent and grow as a parent of students with disabilities. That's amazing. Thank you for that, Dr. Menzo. And I, I love that interconnectivity that you're describing. I also love that not only did you, but also Senator Wong, you brought in the family because you're right. Ultimately, this is, this is a way for the family to enrich in the experience of the child, but also as we saw in some of the testimonials to connect more meaningfully with their children. So this is really powerful. Uh, Judy, I'd love to ask you the same question. You know, you are beginning, you're the, at the beginning of your own journey in this work with UConn. Where do you see your work as it relates to this bigger picture five years from now? Yeah, I, I, I echo the idea that this is really about um, replication elsewhere. Like I think about Movia and I think about getting that into as many schools as possible. And like, what's that gonna take? Because having been in the special education world for so long, um, the idea of this patient non-judgmental way to deliver information in areas that are exponentially in, in need of rinsing and repeating. Like these are lessons that in this audience needs this, you know, over and over. So it's perfect. And then we've got the shortages of teachers. And so it's just this perfect, tool at the perfect time. So I think about it just growing exponentially. Um, and then really for my journey, I think about this, um, again, I don't know if it's going to be in robotics or, or what it's going to be for this college capable learner, but just in terms of the content and transferring that to um, that other age group that's seeking employment. And I think about spreading that to universities all over the country, really. Thank you so much, Judy. I, uh, thank you for that. You know, um, taking Connecticut's example to scale is something that's really promising it, whether it be the wonderful work that UConn is doing in so many different spaces, by the way. Uh, we have the privilege of working with UConn, not only uh, now with you, but also with, uh, with uh, the, the NEAG School of Education and some of your other uh, innovative uh, programs, not only at the School of Public Policy, but also at the law school our flagship institution, Goodwin, I can't say enough about Goodwin University. I'll tell you, Goodwin is where, where uh, the theory meets the road, where practice happens, right? Where the work happens. And I have seen so many of your graduates really deepen their success in the state of Connecticut. So our, our colleges and universities really are as innovative and thoughtful as, as our companies. JP, I wanna give you that moment, uh, your moment to tell us five years from now, where you see your innovation, your thoughtfulness in your company. For all the incredible comments, uh, you know, Senator Wong, Sal, and, you know, and Judy, um, you know, Sal, you touched on a couple of things. I think uh, you and I have probably talked about it, but uh, Movia has a tech roadmap. We have a, a future plan and, and you touched on a lot of those things. But one of the things uh, um, that, you know, just came to, to light is the concept of unified learning. Um, if you follow the concept of unified sports, for example, where you get the neurotypical kid and the neurodiverse kid playing a sport together, it brings them closer together because their focus isn't on an ability or disability. The focus is on the goal of the sport and, and having that fun together. We want to do the same thing with unified learning. What we find with uh, robotics is that it's attractive to every kid doesn't matter neurodiverse, neurotypical. They're both going to sit there and stare at the robot and listen to the robot together. Uh, that, um, that type of concept is in the hearts of all of the parents. Uh, several, you know, um, our chief education officer, Rob Parenti, tells a story about meeting a parent and she just said, I just want my son to be invited to a birthday party. 
So if you think about that, the power of what if that kid had a robot, you know, every kid would want to be at his birthday party, hanging out, playing that robot together. So that's a, that's a wonderful unifier right there, that unified learning piece. And then the, the other piece that I always throw out is uh, how many special ed kids get homework every night? And yet the answer is really not many. But as Sal was mentioning, if the teacher has a system in the school and runs that child, let's just say through the coins program, can email mom at home and say, Johnny did pretty well. Can you reinforce that with his robot at home? The exponential learning that this demographic, this uh, population of kids, it would be exponential from what they're getting right now. Because most of the times when they get home, it's very challenging. And then they get back to school, they got to start with square one. But let's, that's our vision is if we can have a system like this in every school, every classroom, and then in the homes. And we can do that. We're, we're, we're getting there. Um, and then the final piece where in five years, where do we see ourselves? Uh, of course, we want to apply greater technologies to where the robot is reacting uh, specifically to that child and that child's profile uh, and can grow with that child, can adaptively using AI learn uh, in accordance with that child's best needs, a universal learning that the robot can quickly adapt. This child needs it delivered one way. This next child needs it delivered a, a totally different way. And we're that's on our technology roadmap to develop the systems to be able to do that. And then the final piece there would be that that teletherapy or tele telework, teleeducation. We've seen it throughout COVID. How many uh, therapists or teachers would love to have been able to have a telepresence in the home to help out? Well, we can do that with the robot in the house the teacher or therapist can be remote on a Zoom call and ask the parent to just start a program and then observe the child. And Sal, that would, we were talking about a lot of that together. So that's where, that's a nutshell of some of the technology and the roadmap we see. Thank you, thank you, Jean-Pierre. That's really exciting. Senator Wong, uh, as, our, as our resident policymaker and leader, I wanna give you an opportunity to reflect some final thoughts as well. I, 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 I'm listening and, and, and I'm reminded back in 2009, 13 years ago, uh, we worked on uh, uh, legislation that required private insurers to pay for the diagnosis and treatment of autism. That was a four-year struggle. And what it has done for the state of Connecticut is being able to create diagnostics, to be able to get to a better understanding at early childhood and adolescent development, to be able to provide uh, training and support at an early age and adaptive skills. I hope that with the help of Movia and, and others that understands the use of technology and AI supplemented and supported by human interaction, we're able to create much more creative tools to help individuals succeed, to be able to be a part of contributing and engaged in, in society. So I, I think for me, the next five years is a result of the good work that's done many years before. And I want to acknowledge Shannon Knoll. Shannon was one of the big educators for me as a parent who never, ever gave up on the love of her child. Her son, Jack, is now, I think, in his second or third year in college, an active, vibrant, full of personality. So for me, my aspiration in five years is that for every parent that has... Uh, has a child impacted by autism. And I remember hearing parents say, you never expect that as part of a script that you write in being a parent. So once you overcome that, what I hope is in five years that we give all the tools available for loving parents to ensure that their child is going to be as fulfilled as engaged, going back to it. But the tools that we have will be better so that every parent can live in, in, in an understanding that their child will be happy and fulfilled. That to me is, is, an, is a noble goal. And JP, what your company does and, and Dr. Gifford, uh, those are part of the solution that I'm absolutely happy to support. But I wanna thank the champions as well. Uh, there's so many, these are parents that never give up and for the love of their childs, they're remarkable heroes to me.
Thank you, Senator. Uh, Jean-Pierre, Judy, Dr. Menzo, and Senator Wong, I, I just want to thank each and every one of you for engaging in this thoughtful conversation, not only about a small business that really does matter in the state of Connecticut, but that is doing work that matters for the people of the state. And I'm, I'm just so excited that we were able to spotlight your work and all of the potential that's wrapped up in this work. You know, for our viewers, as we're all imagining right now, the perils of technology, the wild west, right, that some of the platforms in which we operate can be, this really shows how when relational work is at the core of the use of that technology, and when serving a vital need, whether it be niche or a great societal need that we are addressing, when we do that with the purpose of deepening and improving relationships, it's only for the benefit of the people of the state communities and society writ large. So with that, I wanna thank you again, uh, Movia for the work that you do, JP and your colleagues. Thank you, Judy, for the work of UConn and the work that you're doing. Dr. Menzo, thank you so much for now at Goodwin. Um, uh, we're so grateful that Wallingford gave you to the rest of us so that now you can do uh, statewide work uh, and Senator Wong for your championship and everyone have a good evening.